not power that corrupts but fear. Fear of losing power corrupts those who wield it and fear of the scourge of power corrupts those who are subject to it. Good evening and welcome. This is Face the Nation. Tomorrow incidentally happens to be International Women's Day. We are celebrating women on Face the Nation tonight. However, our emphasis is on the current economic as well as the political crisis plaguing Sri Lanka. Joining us this evening on the show are Dr. Roshan Pereira, economist, former director of the Risk Management Department of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Attorney at law Bhavani Fonseca, human rights advocate. Professor Priyanjali de Souza, professor in clinical psychology, Department of Psychological Medicine, as well as Dr. Harini Amrasuria, member of parliament, National People's Power. Let's start off tonight's show with uh, Professor Priyanjali de Souza, professor in clinical psychology, Department of Psychological Medicine. Uh, Professor Priyanjali, interestingly, tomorrow happens to be International Women's Day and we are talking about women's issues and this has become a buzzword these days, women's issues. We're talking about issues, we are arguing about it, we're debating about it, we are having spotlights on issues of this sort. However, do you think Sri Lanka, even the political hierarchy, has given proper emphasis on women's issues in today's context? I think more emphasis is certainly needed because if you do look at the status of women in our country there's so much that could be done and so many factors that could be looked at and discussed but I would just like to stress on one fact which I think is very close to my heart is about women empowering women because you know we when we usually talk about international women's day we think oh well what could for example men do to uplift the status of women but i think really the issue really is what could women do to empower other women i have seen in my own personal life and that of people that i do and in our own society as well as research that we have conducted in our country that many times the detriment to one woman's upward mobility whether it's in their personal life, in their career, whatever it is, could be another woman not giving them the helping hand. So I would think rather than looking at the political scenarios and the organizational structures which need to help a woman to go up, if you look at the micro situation, it's about us helping us. That is one thing that I'm interested But there are so many other factors that would obviously contribute to this elevating the status of women in our country. But do you think respective governments, we've had the first female prime minister in the world. Mm. Uh, we had a woman president in Sri Lanka. Do you think when you speak about empowering women, that has happened right throughout in the Sri Lankan context? But I think certain individual women had come into positions of power but if you look at these women who have come into positions of power they may have come there given certain particular circumstances and I personally feel and I'm sure all of us agree that what we see in those figures coming into positions of power those factors are not present for other women left right and center in our countries and in our country in the village level so there are exceptional cases like what you said but the large majority mm. i would think is has a long way to go however if you look at uh, the sri lankan political structure we saw a uh, local government bodies uh, declaring uh, a women representation and uh, this was the first step forward as far as the political hierarchy in the country was being uh, dominated uh, by women so don't you think this was one step in the right direction that I would agree because we do know that when a country through legally or other means put down certain rules or regulation that certainly helps a particular segment of the population to go forward you know for example in France now one of the laws is in every company needs to have at least one female director represented there it could be your grandmother but still there should be one. So when you have those legal changes, people also know to be more open-minded. So that is certainly a uh, positive fact. But then it has to be also internalized in the human. That's the second step. So we have those things happening. But is it actually internalized in us to accept women in that stance? It's a question. 
Um, uh, Professor Priyanjali, if you take a look at the last few months, um, this probably may seem to be a political question. However, I need to pose this question to you. Why? Because right now, uh, women are being uh, women are being subjected to many issues. Uh, sexism taking place even mm. in the parliament. We saw this happening uh, a few um, months ago. Uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, a ruling party member of parliament uh, making um, insinuation uh, to women with regard to um, vegetables and so on and so forth. So this was not the right way to move forward. So even in a situation like that, do you think the ruling party has been able to uh, discipline or bring about uh, a situation where women feel safe not only in the parliament but across uh, the political dynamics in the country i would think it is far lacking isn't it because if you look at as a woman as an individual whether we are in our workplaces or whether we are in public spheres or going in public transport forget about what happened in the parliament but it is a reflection of what is happening there uh, and I, as an individual who have lived here all my life, for five decades nearly, I haven't seen great changes in my personal and psychological safety in many spheres of my life. So, and that is what is reflected in more obvious spheres, such as maybe what is happening in the parliament. So, Professor Priyanjali, what is the next step as far as protecting women's rights are concerned? in this little island nation what must we do collectively mm. to safeguard their rights but i think there are different levels at which we could do and as you said earlier law legal statute you know thing rules that this is the way it should be is of course important because it is laws also tell the people what we expect from them so it's a information giving awareness raising tactic so that's fine. But then when somebody transgresses this law, say somebody uh, sexually or verbally or physically harasses me, mm. when I go to a law enforcement agency or a place of authority, do they take me seriously or do they brush me off? Then implementation of that law has to be also done that. But more deeper is actually humane changes in people. And that's where this first issue I spoke about, about women empowering women. Because I see, and personally we have done some research on, uh, for example, envy among the two genders, we find that uh, there's a lot of lack in women empowering women, women being there for women, you see. So then those kind of deep-seated psychological changes in the psyche of both men and women, that is a lot of work done. And that starts from education at school level as well as home level. So those can take a long time to happen. Humane changes in the collective conscious of a country. Uh, Professor Priyanjali, now we saw what happened in Parliament um, a couple of months ago. Uh, there was no formal apology uh, by the Member of Parliament as well. Uh, with regard to the statement that he made. Do you think such scenarios or incidents of this sort discourages women to enter the political fray in Sri Lanka? Certainly. Obviously, isn't it? And I think also, you know, if you look at the first sentence, you said apologizing. For many people, whether it's a personal apology or a public apology, they feel it's a dent to their self-confidence and self-esteem. But we do know that it's actually the opposite if you do some wrong to come out and say when publicly giving an apology actually puts them in a higher stance in the eyes of the public but unfortunately most people don't know that and then coming to your second question per se is that certainly if a, a group of individuals are ridiculed and looked down upon collectively then members of that group would think twice that is quite natural then they are voiceless but don't you think when we speak about empowerment, uh, Professor Priyanjali, it starts, it has to start from the grassroots. It has to be a bottom-up approach rather than a top-down approach. I think it is a bottom-up as well as a top-down. Like for example, a program that a particular non-governmental organization, local one that I'm working with, we are doing some work on empowering young boys, preteen boys, to look at females as their equal, as their counterpart, as their ally, through the medium of sports, cricket, for example. 
So that is a top up approach you know at young ages so we need that certainly as you say but we also need the top down approach also. So the top has to change and reflect that in their words and behaviors as well as we need to work in our homes, in our schools, in our community setups to give young people strategies and changing their outlook about how they look at vulnerable populations. When you look at women in politics, uh, we have Dr. Hayang Amarsuri, who's a very successful uh, parliamentarian uh, in the Sri Lankan parliament currently. Um, she is a nationalist member of parliament as well. But overall, if you look at the role of women in politics, do you think uh, there is a dent in this sector? There needs to be improvement. Women have to come to the forefront. They need to not shy away from politics and they have to play a bigger role in making sure they come to the center stage. Uh, Dr. Professor Pianjali, I'm posing the question to you. Oh, I thought you yes. were yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. Can you repeat that question? No, again? so my question is now we have individuals like Dr. Harun Yamrasuri who has come to uh, uh, the uh, parliament through the national list uh, from the NPP. Um, but don't you think it's important um, for women to take up uh, the position of entering the political fora? and entering the political fray and be a, a, a dominant part in the Sri Lankan political culture as we speak because at the end of the day women in politics must be there in a country like Sri Lanka because we appointed the first female prime minister we had a female president and now what is next so mm -hmm. women do also have a role to play here don't you think so? certainly certainly and people like Harini uh, coming into politics with uh, the relevant background is so essential to because it also I think it also breaks down stereotypes isn't it but what the public and those inside the parliament may have about a woman and a woman politician because of the way we conduct ourselves so certainly having women in politics out there voicing their views in a most objective manner is essential not only for the political situation in our country but also to break down stereotypes prejudice and discrimination against women so the woman that is in that position mm. can do a lot if done well if done well yes and there are instances in which that has not been the case as well uh, in the Sri Lankan uh, well all human beings can make mistakes uh, including myself. Okay. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Priyanjali So he's a uh, professor in clinical psychology, Department <coughs> of Psychological Medicine. We, of course, have a lot of questions to you in this respect uh, as the show goes along. Um, and I want to now move my attention to uh, uh, Dr. Harini Amrasuria, Member of Parliament of the National People's Power. Uh, Dr. Harini, my question predominantly is not about women, but how women are being affected with regard to the current political dynamic in Sri Lanka because if you look at the current economy in the country at the end of the day it's the woman who is suffering she goes to the shop she does her purchasing and so on and so forth I'm not in any way saying that men shouldn't do that and men are not affected uh, due to the current political crisis as well as the current economic crisis in the country in your view in a situation of this sort Dr. Harini how can women cope up now do they have a voice? Now we saw uh, Hirunika Premachandra uh, yesterday going to the president's um, house to stage a protest. Uh, several hours later, it happened the reverse. It just it happened again at her house. Uh, we saw a protest being held. Uh, we see uh, tit for tat. Uh, that was the clear uh, mentality of the government. In a situation like that, do you think women have a women can play a role in the Sri Lankan political uh, arena? Well, women certainly can. The, the issue is that it's very, very difficult, as we saw with the Hirunika's issue, where it was a very, uh, very juvenile move, I think, by the government to, uh, to sort of respond in that way. I mean, completely unnecessary. Uh, but that's politics in Sri Lanka right now. So I think many women who are uh, coming forward uh, who are resisting what is going on are very aware of uh, what they may call upon themselves. I'm sure Hirunika was very aware that what she was doing is not going to go down well with this government. I think we are all aware of how the government would respond to any kind of criticism whether it be by men or man or woman. So, uh, but as you said the situation, the current political crisis has a very 
definite effect on women because it's entered our homes, it's entered our daily lives in, in unimaginable ways, right? And we saw that also during the COVID period with uh, increased workloads on women and the increased no amount of hours that they have to spend on care work, right? Uh, with schools shutting down, with hospitals, uh, uh, you know, having restricted access, all of these things we saw, I'm sure Pianjali can talk about this a lot more, but incidents of domestic violence increasing, child abuse increasing. So we can see how this crisis has had a very definite impact on, on women. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a result of years of neglecting our social security and social protection. Uh, processes and institutions. So the failure of those institutions at times of vulnerability, at times of crisis like this, mean then that women mm. uh, inevitably uh, have to uh, face a heavier burden. Right. So Dr. Hari, now I'm going to shift my gears uh, to the current uh, political crisis in Sri Lanka. Now, a few uh, days ago, we saw Uday Gammampela, uh, a member of the cabinet uh, one time, a strongman of uh, the SLPP government. Vimal Virawansa, a strongman of the SLPP government and also someone who championed the cause of uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa coming into the forefront as a presidential candidate, were both sacked from the ministerial post. And many of the opinion that all of this is a farce, it's a play. We've seen such plays happening in the Sri Lankan political fora for many, many years. We are not out of it. We are currently facing an economic crisis. Henceforth, the government may be trying to bring out a play to persuade the public to believe something else is going on. Do you think all this is an act of play or is it really happening? Is it the reality right now? The government is in crisis. Well, the government is definitely in crisis. I think that it's very evident that uh, there is there, there are tensions within the government. You can see the contradictory statements that different members of the of government are making and that's kind of testament to the fact that there are so many contradictions and they're not really sort of consulting with each other and speaking in one voice. That's very clear, the tensions within the government. This particular incident that you're referring to, I think people have all the right in the world to feel skeptical about this because we have seen such performances in the past. And also these were the very members who were instrumental in setting up this government. Right? These were the very people who were vociferously... The pillars, the, the pillars of the SLPP government? Pillars of the SLPP government vociferously agitating on behalf of the 20th Amendment, which, had, which, uh, uh, which we know had such negative imp impact on sort of the governance uh, model in our country. And these people defended all of that. Right? So, uh, so when they suddenly sort of turned around and talk about uh, you know, the, the fact that this govern, government is failing to govern, right, and that there's a f failing of leadership, you, you really wonder what were, what were they thinking, right? What were they thinking uh, two, one, one and a half years ago? What were they thinking in 2016 when, when they actually started mobilizing to form, a, form this government and started projecting Gotabe Rajapaksa as the next presidential candidate? Surely, I mean, many of us in the opposition were quite aware that uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa would probably be one the weakest person that you could put into this position. So were they not aware of this? So why are they sort of suddenly sort of coming to this realization now, right? So it, I think people are perfectly no, but, but, justified but, 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 in yeah, feeling but, skeptical. Yeah, but when you look at the statements that are being projected or made by Abhimal Virwans and Udega Mampil, it's very much directed to Finance Minister yes. Basil Rajapaksa. Yeah. So the rift seems to be not with President Gotabe Rajapaksa, but with Basil Rajapaksa influencing uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa to take decisions. Don't you think that's the case? That's what they say. And it, I, I think there is, uh, there is perhaps a clash be uh, between uh, Basil Rajapaksa and the more nationalist elements within the SLPP, right? That seems to uh, that well, that was quite evident in in how the government functioned. But this was this is also a problem of leadership, right? I mean, it's also about managing those differences. And such an unwieldy alliance. You have sort of uh, you know sort of uh, radical kind of singular nationalists, 
uh, as well as uh, a finance minister who is quite comfortable being a citizen of, uh, of the US, right? Mm. Uh, so it's a very unwieldy alliance and there doesn't seem to be much coherence in terms of their policy or ideology. But mm. this is a group that came together merely to bring the Rajapaksas back into power. Right? This is not something where which, which has a well thought out kind of ideological stance where they are, where we, to which they subscribe. So that the cracks are, are evident now. So Dr. Harani, when you look at the statement that was made by uh, Vimal Virawansa, he says that in 2019, when they were deciding of a presidential candidate, Basil Rajapaksa has told uh, the parties uh, with the SLPP that he wants to be the presidential candidate and this is what my Vivan said, not, I'm not in any way <laughs> trying to put words into his mouth or whatever it is but this is what he said. Uh, however, when you look at the 20th amendment to the constitution, these parties initially refused to go ahead with the government. However, months later, weeks later, they went and vote, it voted in favour of the 20th amendment to the constitution. So this was a result of Basil Rajapaksa coming into the play or coming into the limelight as the Minister of Finance because of the majority, two thirds majority they, they got for the 20th Amendment of the Constitution. This is why people are saying that this probably may be a drama, this may probably be a play uh, just to uh, arrange the uh, podium for someone else to take or probably may be having ambitions to be the President of the country, you never know. Uh, all I can say is none of what is happening in terms of what you just described, this drama that is being enacted, is going to solve any of the problems that we are facing. Mm -hmm. The sacking of the ministers is not helping us in any way. The disunity within the uh, government is not helping in, in any way. The contradictory statements that they are making is not any. In, so this whole sort of drama, whether it's uh, real or not, has nothing to do with the problems that people are facing. Right? And that, I think, is the problem, that we are being distracted, that the government is, seems to be more interested in sort of uh, maintaining its own power base. I, I also saw a statement by, I think, um, Minister Vasudeva Nanya Kara, where he had said that this was done in order to stop uh, those uh, disgruntled with the government from either moving to the NPP or to the, the, to the SJB. So Will the NDP accept individuals of this caliber? Mm -hmm. Malavira no, not at market? all, not at all. But I think what he meant was voters, mm -hmm. right? That disgruntled voters are now moving towards the NPP and the SJB. I think that this this is a move to stop that, to stop the bleeding of voters away from their party. I mean, how how cynical uh, a statement is that? This country is on the brink of bankruptcy and all they are thinking about is how yes. to maintain their voter base right. by sort of preventing voters from moving to other parties. Well, I mean, what is that? What I want to understand, one final question to you, uh, Dr. Harini, what I want to understand is um, uh, we saw how rifts are being created by the Vajapaks administration for many, many years. Yeah. Uh, we saw uh, when Sri Lanka cricket uh, chairman was uh, Arjun Ranatunga, <coughs> they sacked Arjun Ranatunga and appointed Nishant Ranatunga, his brother, as the secretary of Sri Lanka cricket. We saw this happening. Uh, now we see three people, uh, mainly uh, Udega Mampil, Vimal Viravansa and Vasudeva Nanaka were very critical of the government. Only two members were sacked, one remained. Mm. So this is all a farce and a drama. I think it's all, it, it shows even more clearly, if we had any doubt whatsoever about this, right. that this government is only interested in maintaining its power in wh whatever means and whatever strategies it can use, that it has no interest in solving the problems of the people that the people are facing. I think that much is evident. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harini Amar Surya. We have a lot of questions for you in terms of the political future of uh, the NPP as well. We'll pose them to you as the show goes along. Uh, I now move my attention to uh, Dr. Roshan Pereira, economist, former director, risk management department, uh, Central Bank of Sri Lanka. I don't know, Dr. Roshan, whether you are aware of the recent statement, uh, the statement that was issued by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka just a couple of minutes ago. It says, policy package to support greater macroeconomic stability, allowing flexibility in the exchange rate. As a result of that, the Central Bank is also of the view that forex transactions will take place at levels which are not more than 230 per US dollar now. Prudent decision came too late. 
What are your views? Uh, thank you once again for having me on this program. I think we have to look at the whole macroeconomic picture, all the indicators. If you look at all the indicators, so you can't look at just one, just the exchange rate, exchange rate in isolation. You have to look at all the indicators. And if you look at all the indicators, for many months, economies have been saying that things have been are worsening. Mm. I mean, I, I'll just give you a sort of a snapshot of some of the indicators. If you look at the growth rates, growth rates have been negative. We've never, we haven't had negative growth rates. Uh, the last time we had negative growth rates were in 2001. And that's when we had uh, an, an it, uh, attack on our airport, as well as it, it was a global financial crisis. So you can see in, from the real sector, we've, we are in one of the worst uh, in terms of growth. In terms of inflation, we've got one of the highest inflation rates. Uh, not, not one of the highest, but uh, in, the, in the recent past. So I think f since t 13 years ago, we've not had double-digit inflation. And the last time we had this kind of inflation was at the height of the war. So inflation is at the worst. Uh, if you look at in terms of the fiscal, we know that uh, our deficit, again, is one of the highest we've seen uh, in, in, in recent times. The last time we had over 10% uh, deficit was again during the war and also before that was in 2001 again because of there were se several other uh, factors that contributed to that. Debt is close to 110 percent of GDP again we've, there are very few years in which it has gone to that level um, our, our f in terms of our external financing uh, we've got a negative I mean our overall balance is negative Again, there are very few years in which we've had a negative overall balance, uh, which is basically directly related to our foreign reserves, which are probably at the lowest level, level we've ever had. Uh, and then finally, look at the monetary sector. You can see that mon money supply has been growing at a very high rate uh, because the central bank has been monetizing the deficit, financing the deficit. Uh, uh, so if you look at all those factors, you can see that uh, Sri Lanka's macroeconomic situation is at a very low point. Uh, so, so you, anybody who's looking at it and trying to, you know, come up with a policy package, has to look at it holistically. You look at every aspect, and and whatever you prescribe has to be based on that. So, I know the central bank had their monetary policy um, announcement a few few days ago. They had a whole slew of policy uh, prescriptions or po you know policy changes. Mm -hmm. uh, one was the increase in the interest rate, and then several other things. But they never mentioned the exchange rate, and that was kind of the elephant in the room because everybody knew okay the exchange rate was having a big impact on several other you know it, mm -hmm. there was a there was a sort of knock-on effect of this fixed exchange rate on several other sectors of the economy. No, but in, in the government's defense, uh, Dr. Roshan Pera, they speak about the uh, exchange rate. Um, they're saying incentivizing foreign remittances and investments further is very important and the government should diligently uh, consider uh, these matters. But uh, if the government probably did not revise the exchange rate, my opening question would, to you would have been, why is the central bank of Sri Lanka saying the government to consider such a move when the onus is on the government's hand or the central bank's hand with regard to uh, increasing uh, or devaluing the currency is concerned. Uh, so the government seems to be in the right direction. Do you think so? Because 230, is it too low or is it too high? So, so going back to, the, I, I have to say, yes, finally we are going in the right direction. We are finally going in the right direction. Yes. Uh, well, that's so there seems to be some it. light end of the mm -hmm. tunnel right now. Uh, well, it's a long, it's going to be a long <laughs> road ahead. Right. So this is only the beginning and I think in a way it's, it, it is too little too late because we should have done this probably six months ago, a lot of these things. The exchange rate in the, in the, in the curb market was probably 230, about four, four five or six months ago. Now going at 248, 215. Exactly. So, so it's a little too late, but at least it is in the right direction. And I hope we will continue to do this, make these changes. So, Dr. Roshan, my question to you is, are we in this abyss right now, the economic abyss that we are facing right now, because of the negligence of the government and not taking the right decision at the right time? Because we saw in January, 
we had to make a payment of 500 million US dollars uh, on ISP payments and we had um, a lot of people on this show uh, we sp spoke about it as well uh, chambers uh, the Sudan Chamber of Commerce former chairmen came on the show they were very vocal about the government uh, to not go ahead and pay the 500 million US dollars to restructure the debt even at that time are we in this crisis at the moment in terms of fuel pharmaceutical products so on and so forth because of the government took a very arrogant stance in January to pay that 500 million US dollars uh, ISB so I don't think that that was kind of we came to a head at that point and that's why uh, uh, many economists many uh, business people th that was kind of concerted opinion that we should uh, at least ask for a sort of a moratorium on that payment and then to start the restructuring process or to start a negotiation with our creditors to not to repay the debt uh, and and I, I just can tell you I mean at that time if you looked at it if you if you looked at how much 500 billion could buy in terms of your imports um, it would have bought you about half a year of your medicines which in a way now we're struggling to even pay even to order the next you know there, there are shortages of even essential medicines vital medicines paracetamol is not available uh, so in a sense if you had not made that 500 million you might have been able to buy medicines for six months uh, you would have been able to buy dairy for about an, one and a half years of dairy you could have had sugar for another yeah another one and a half to two years or for fertilizer for two two years in 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 relation to like a normal year or fuel for two years as well but instead we're struggling like it's a, it's a hand-to-mouth existence because every day we're trying to see how, whether we can have like 35 million dollars or 24 million dollars just to buy the next or, or to pay for the next shipment or to order the next ship open the LC for the next shipment mm -hmm. so that is the reason why I think many people uh, felt it was prudent to save those fi that 500 million dollars and buy what was essential for people for people's general well-being I mean today if you go to see even even I think the gas companies have said that they are unable to to uh, to place their open LCs to be able to open the uh, to to order their next gas shipment and there are many restaurants many small businesses many little boutiques that have closed down I mean I know because I tried to go and buy string hoppers today and string hoppers are not you cannot not buy them in the market because they say they don't have gas yes. so these are I mean can you imagine the knock-on effect of of these decisions are, are huge and if if somebody tries to cost them um, the, the impact on the economy is huge. I mean, uh, you, you can't even you can't imagine what impact it's going to have, and and this is just only the beginning. Right? So it, it'll, it'll go on for a few more months. So what I don't understand, Dr. Roshan, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here with my uh, analogy. Uh, uh, when the government and the country is facing a crisis at the moment in terms of inflationary pressure at 15.1 percent. Uh, and the co-inflation at 10.9 percent for the month of february the government is trying to draw, draw a parallel to the world economic growth which is moderate and says that inflation will remain higher globally in the months ahead this was uh, the uh, policy uh, stance of the monetary board of the central bank of sri lanka which was issued on the uh, 4th of march 2022 is it fair to compare the two can you say global uh, economy is going to be moderate to lower? Uh, it's uh, projected at 5.9%. Now it is going to be projected at 4.4%. This is what the central bank report says. Inflation to be high because of the logistical crisis as well as the issues uh, prevailing with regard to supply chain. Uh, and then trying to draw a parallel to the Sri Lankan context. Is that fair? So inflation uh, and growth, yes, we do. There are external factors and there are domestic factors. So yes, there will be certain external factors that will affect the Sri Lankan economy because we are a small open economy. But I think if you look at inflation, yes, there might be some supply side issues but, and, and issues related to fuel pricing. Uh, but the thing is, it's not necessarily feeding into the economy because we have administrative prices. Mm. So at the moment, if you look at uh, 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 inflation, uh, it, it's not really reflecting that, which is which is also wrong because 
because we have other issues by not right. not not adjusting our fuel prices. But I think our domestic inflation prices, and you just talked about co-inflation. Co-inflation is basically demand. That is why you calculate co-inflation, which is really due to demand pressures, which are domestic. Is due to a uh, huge uh, monetary expansion that we've had because the central bank has been monetizing the deficit, and we've had, had huge tax cuts, which have also fed into. Uh, basically, people have had too much money. There's too much money in the system, uh, which is feeding into inflation. So. I don't think you can completely say that it is only due to external factors. There are definitely domestic factors, and also the agriculture issue, the agriculture supply issue. So I think there are a lot of factors that you have to, uh, you know, take into consideration uh, when you look at the inflation numbers. And and then the other number that you didn't talk about was food inflation, which is at 26 percent, mm. uh, and I think in two years it is about 30, 36 uh, percent. So so I, it's not only international factors but definitely domestic factors have contributed to where we are so the man with seven brains in the ministry of finance and the man with one brain in the central bank has been unable to resurrect the country's economy over the last few months um well what i have to say is there are technocrats who are also there and i think a lot of them are educated same education that i, I mean similar education that i have or, or many of our economists have have had uh, so I, I think it's not a matter of not knowing what to do but it's a matter of you the will to do it um, I'm glad that at least now uh, they've started doing it but as I said it's a too late too little too late and I hope we will continue to make the adjustments because unless we make the adjustments uh, the pain is going to be much greater walking out of the cabinet uh, Minister Deka Mampila Dr. Roshan Pereira said this is worse than terrorism that plagued Sri Lanka for 30 years, the exchange crisis. What is your view? So, as I said at the beginning, I, I read out to you all the indicators, and, and many of these indicators are worse than or as bad as what we had maybe during the war, or maybe worse. Uh, so, you have to make your judgment on that. Right. But, but it is bad. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roshan Pereira. I want to move my attention now uh, uh, to uh, attorney at law, Bhavani Fonseca, human rights advocate. Um, Bhavani, nice to have you on the show on International Women's Day. We are celebrating women today, but we have a lot of core issues to discuss uh, surrounding the country's uh, human rights situation as well, because right now, as you speak, the United Nations Human Rights Council sessions are in progress and attention is now focused on Sri Lanka. What is your take with regard to the recent statement made by the Human Rights Commissioner about Sri Lanka. The situation is deteriorating, but she says at one point that she's encouraged by the actions taken by the government to amend the Prevention of Terrorism Act as well. So there seems to be some right, right direction for the government, don't you think so? Or is it, or is it still bad? Um, well, Shamir, thank you for having me. Um, and uh, a fabulous panel. I would be very concerned to say that the government is taking a right direction. Um, as we've said when the PT amendments were proposed, that these are very minimalist reforms. This is not really going to address the ground realities. And if you look at the High Commissioner's report, which was tabled at the Council, and today there was an interactive dialogue, and um, we also had various speeches made on Friday and today, including by the Cardinal who made a uh, statement. So I think there's some interesting comments being made by different actors. And except for the government and maybe a handful, everyone raises concerns as to the deteriorating human rights situation and the rule of law in terms of militarization, in terms of institutions being politicized, in terms of token efforts to appease certain segments of society and international community. So I'm not quite clear when you say, are we taking the right direction? Which direction are we headed? So, uh, uh, Bhavan, you say that uh, many countries are saying that they're concerned about the human rights track record in Sri Lanka. Let's look at the statement that was made by China today. China says, China always opposes politicizing human rights issues and interfering in other countries' internal affairs under the pretext of human rights issues. The United Kingdom says, we welcome recent releases on bail of Ashraf Jazim 
and Hijaz Hezbollah as a positive first step. Amnesty International says uh, that uh, the decision taken to uh, uh, to amend the uh, Prevention of Terrorism Act um, is uh, commendable. So what do you mean by Sri Lanka is not, not on the right track? Well, I think if you look at the other statements which you didn't read out, mm -hmm. I think it speaks to the reality of the country. Uh, China, I'm not surprised, took that line. China is a friend of Sri Lanka, the government of Sri Lanka. You have friends that will speak up in terms of what the government wants the international community to hear. But you also have a champion of this government or earlier champion going to the council and raising very serious concerns about the impunity about the Easter Sunday attacks which is very very similar to concerns raised by victims and civil society for decades in terms of impunity so you know you will get a handful speaking on certain issues you which is very similar to what the government's hymn sheet is so you have very similar statements coming from particular actors now the high commission also recognizes some things have worked or there's been proposals made but the question is are these proposals going to make a difference on the ground and in terms of the PTA reforms the question is are they real reforms and in my opinion if you have things like confession still on the legal on the, in the law you're not going to have a major difference with the token reforms they're proposing so I'll, I'll just also say the government says this is a first step in terms of reform why not press on the whole gamut at this moment? What's holding them back? Because we've seen in the past when there is political will to push reforms, they will speed it through. But on certain things, there's very, very slow progress in terms of reform. So those questions should also be posed. Right. So, uh, Bhavani, um, when we speak about the April 21st attacks, um, it's very clear that this was one of the reasons that the present government is in power because they came under the pretext of uh, uh, bringing forth uh, bringing forth security to the country uh, making sure that the country was devoid of terrorism uh, and spoke a lot about Islamic terrorism in the country and if they were in power this wouldn't have been the case the deterioration of the uh, of the intelligence service in Sri Lanka all this was spoken about and they came with the pretext that when we come to power we will do justice we will make sure that those who committed these crimes will be brought before the law and they would be punished for the crimes they did. However, when we hear the statement that was made by uh, His Eminence Malcolm Cardinal Ranjit, Archbishop of Colombo, not now, but even before, he goes on to state that justice has not been meted out to the victims of the uh, terrorist attacks on the 21st of April. Uh, a couple of years ago. He says that uh, instead of uncovering the truth behind the attack and prosecuting those responsible, there are attempts to harass and intimidate those who clamor for justice. It seems the government has shot itself on the foot. What are your thoughts? Well, Shamir, I, I, I don't have much to say. I think the Cardinal's speech today and previous as well speaks to the reality of this country. You know, you have a situation where so many people's lives were lost and that propelled, and I think we need to recognize, that propelled this narrative of wanting a strong leader. So I think there's something there that one needs to look at and the Cardinal's speech today also speaks about a political plot. What is this plot? Why are these questions still being asked? You know, the Parliament Select Committee in 2019 had a process where they looked into this matter and there is a report, a Parliament Select Committee report. There's a Commission of Inquiry report. There's several investigations that went into this. We still are going in circles in terms of why this happened, what were the failures, and so many years later, the question of why is there no accountability. Now, Easter Sunday, I think, is one example of the problems of this country. We have had decades of cycles of violence. We have decades of violations happening, and spe specifically 
towards a minority community. Now, has anyone been held accountable for these violations? What we see mostly is either someone getting a pardon, and we've had presidential pardons, or people, the charges being dropped, um, or cases being delayed. You know, you have a system where the impunity is entrenched. It's not just with the Easter Sunday attacks. So, in terms of this HRC process, coming back to the Human Rights Council, it's an opportunity for the government to genuinely engage and say they have a roadmap, they're going to do certain things. And let's be very, very clear, Sri Lanka has be been before the Council for now a decade. The first resolution was in 2012. Now, after a decade, we're still having the same conversations of a homegrown solution. Why are we going back to these conversations when there's really no political will? It seems politics have held hostage in terms of addressing grievances of communities, addressing accountability, addressing impunity. So we are in September when Sri Lanka comes up again, and that's the session where we're yet to see if there's going to be a new resolution. That, that'll be an interesting time. What is the government's answer? And in terms of now we're talking about economic crisis, what is the game plan for the next few years? Yeah, so uh, I, I have a lot of questions for you, um, Bhavani, but I'm going to leave that uh, uh, for later uh, when the, the when the Q&A opens up. Um, for, for, from, for, to pose questions from panelists, uh, but you speak about a grand political plot. Now, this was something that was articulated. I don't. Not, the, not, the not Cardinal, not spoke Cardinal. About Cardinal. It. Cardinal says about a grand political plot, and he articulates this, uh, saying, uh, "Subsequent investigations indicate that this massacre was part of a grand political plot." So I quote him here. What is your opinion? Do I you think, think the government is shying away from bringing those responsible to book because there is some sort of. Uh, problem they don't want to you know upset anyone or upset the apple cart right now is there something well i can't speak to the government i think you need to ask the government as to what what their grand plan is um i think the cardinal raises some valid questions that have been asked before it's the difference is the cardinal is now asking these questions Lots of people have asked why has there been no accountability when there's been several commissions of inquiry, when there's been a parliament select committee. These are not information that's not been out there. Now, we also had a former investigator mm -hmm. filing a fundamental rights application, which also that petition has some very serious allegations in terms of intelligence, in terms of structures. So. All that is now in the public domain. Why has there been no accountability with considering the fact there is information in the public domain? Who is to gain? I think the question should be as who is gaining or who gained from what happened with the Easter Sunday attack and the continuation of uncertainty and whether this would lead to something else. Whoever gained, whatever they gained, uh, Bhavani, the question mark right now is we are in a dilemma at the moment. Uh, so I open the floor for questions uh, from our journalists. On my immediate right is um, Nadim Maji. Nice to have you back, Nadim, after uh, the COVID scare. Was it was it square or scare? Or were you really infected with COVID? Infected. 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 So nice to have you back. Uh, I hope you're okay. <coughs> All Feeling well. And uh, onto my immediate left is um, Azra Sun. Um, because it's International <coughs> Women's Day tomorrow, Nadim, we'll start off the show tonight with uh, Azra. Thanks, Sham. I hope every day is uh, Women's Day. Women's so day. I'll, uh, start with <laughs> Professor Angelic Soiza. Uh, but generally, I always start off uh, yeah. with the lady. Unnecessary comment, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He generally yes. always starts off oh, with an unnecessary yeah. comment. <laughs> <laughs> right, so all um, those are. Professor, uh, we speak about the contribution of women <coughs> to the country and the economy as a whole. And um, according to the statistics available by 2019, 29% uh, is the contribution of women uh, when it comes to the economy of the country. We see a lot of potential, and times have changed. <laughs> Uh, women are now taking charge of things and getting things done. But uh, something that we don't really uh, talk much, but is actually a problem, uh, this whole reluctance uh, to continue with their career when it comes to uh, childbirth and marriage. Don't really see an, an answer to that question, but that's something we all uh, feel at some uh, age. What is your take on that? 
Mm. I think that's such an important question, Azra. I'm so glad that you asked. It's very close to my heart. We do know that if you look at the number of girl children and school and boy children who go to school and finish secondary education, it's very favorable to us girls as well as boys. There's some equality. Then if you look at tertiary education, there's more females also coming into university level education. So that's fantastic, you know. But what we then see subsequent to completing tertiary education, or even if it's not tertiary education, if they go straight <coughs> to a job, getting and being in the job, that starts falling off, either at the time of marriage or at childbirth. Now, the reasons for that is many, and one could be the fact that we come from a very traditional collectivist country, where it is assumed that men are the ones who can go up the career ladder, be out there in the front, fantastic, but the women is assumed to have to take the role of the secondary position. And unfortunately, when these kind of very sub these beliefs are there, very ingrained into a society, the women also believe that. So when they are given an opportunity to shine, they might feel very odd about it, very awkward. And they might pass opportunity to another person, particularly a male. So the issue is, when a woman takes a back seat in their career, or even give up their career, what could happen is, if at the time of marriage or childbirth, if something happens in the marriage, you know, if there is a separation or a divorce or a death of the spouse, then she is in a quite a very dicey financial situation. So one of the, impo the main important points is that for the women to stay in the career and go up for her own sake financially. Secondly is being in a career, being in a job also gives a woman support mechanisms, resources self-esteem, opportunity to develop self-esteem. So all of those things are positives of having your own life, your own career, your own, you know, life path. Yeah. So, um, and how to get there in a traditional collectivist country is a different matter. But it is important to get there. But that is a challenge. It is a challenge, yeah. yeah. Because these are ingrained, isn't it? They're but convinced to feel a certain yeah, way. Yeah, the women But we see plenty of women uh, now you know, balancing everything out, although it is very tiring and hectic. Yeah. So it is not impossible. It's not impossible. And I think, as you say, it's tiring and hectic yeah. for those women who do. Because why could it be that the man doesn't also do their part of the bargain as well? So the woman has to do the marketing and the grocery shopping, do the homework, but the man might come and sit and watch TV and expect the teacup to be given as well. So those kind of polarities have to be balanced out, Azra. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Bhavani, uh, just recently uh, the government reversed uh, the burial policy when it comes to COVID-19 uh, deaths. But uh, we can't uh, forget the noise the government made initially when uh, this uh, whole situation came to light. How 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 is it how how is the government making a decision now? Don't we still have the same risks like we did back then? I think that's a very good question, Nasra. I mean, when they first imposed this burial, um, the forced cremation uh, policy, lots of us questioned as to what is the scientific basis. And we are yet to get that answer as to what is the scientific basis. And this speaks to such a cruel policy which really robbed dignity of so many families and communities and really it's something that really left us a lot of us speechless as to how this could be pushed through by this government but it also speaks to a very racist mindset or at least of a segment of this government that didn't care targeted a particular community and this policy is not just one, only one isolated incident. We've seen a whole spate of actions taken to target the minorities of this country, particularly the Muslim community, and that conversation in terms of the other. So with the, this particular issue now, suddenly with the Chasi session, we have them reversing a policy. Now last year when the chassis session commenced, 
they did the same thing. So it's also the question of do they suddenly wake up to this when the Human Rights Council sessions are in force? Is it the international community that matters to them more than a particular group of people, citizens of this country? So yet to date, I am yet to hear um, any scientific reason as to why they had this in place in terms of the forced cremation and then the burial issue in terms of moving bodies to automobility. So there are lots of questions, but this is just, I think, an example of this government having knee-jerk policies, particularly having policies targeting communities, particular communities, with no rationality, no rationality whatsoever, and speaks to also the lack of communication. There is no information. We have to have a guessing game, and around the HRC session, there's suddenly some movement. So there's no plan. But do you think that the international community is convinced? Because when I listen to the interactive dialogue today, uh, Belarus, Russia, China and Pakistan were okay about the situation. But everyone else, including the UK, the USA, Amnesty International, our own uh, civil society uh, representatives, they were all very critical of the government and the conduct of the government. So what, what is the message? Is the government not getting the message? Is that the problem? I think if you just look at the names you mentioned, Russia, China, Belarus, if you look at the international, what's happening internationally, these are not the, the human rights friendly countries. So let's, I, I just want to leave it there. In terms of Ukraine and all of that, I'll just leave it there in terms of, are we looking to them to uphold human rights? Um, but in terms of the other countries, civil society, international community, and s sections of Sri Lankan society, I mean, this is not just a Geneva problem. This is happening in Sri Lanka. Now, what's sad is that w around the Human Rights Council, there's movement on certain things, the PTA reforms the burial issue. You know, there's some movement, suddenly you get compensation being paid. Suddenly there is a recognition that access to justice is important. There's token efforts, minimalist efforts around this time. But the rest of the year, there's complete tone deafness from this government. So really, if you're genuinely interested, why not address some of the ground realities? Custodial deaths, torture, you know, what's happening even in terms of the agriculture sector, everything. There's a whole gamut of things they can do. But around a chassis session, you get some movement. Mm. And then it's forgotten again till the next session. Mm. So I, th I, I frankly think it's a farce. Dr. Roshan, uh, speaking about the Russian-Ukrainian crisis, uh, we can't forget the impact it has on a country like Sri Lanka as well. Uh, Russia and Ukraine, um, when it comes to exports and imports, we sure uh, have to face some sort of consequences. Uh, what is your take on how Sri Lanka will be impacted economically uh, when it comes to the Russian-Ukrainian crisis? Um, yes, so uh, you're right. I mean, we have. Uh, Sri Lanka will be affected on multiple levels actually. Uh, firstly, starting with the oil prices, it was $130 a barrel today. Exactly, so oil prices are going to affect hmm. us very badly um, uh, because obviously they are major suppliers. Uh, Ukraine is also a wheat producer and yeah. a wheat uh, exporter, uh, so that's going to affect because if wheat prices go up uh, or, or you're not able to supply the wheat, then obviously. Uh, people will start shifting to other grains, which means rice. And at the moment, we know that we are going to have a severe shortage of rice uh, in the next harvest, which means that we will have to import rice. Mm. So the price of rice could go up uh, and, and other grains as well. You know, you don't know what the knock-on effects on other the commodities will be. So commodity prices will go up. But on the other side, we also have um, uh, Russian, uh, we, we export tea to Russia. So right. I think that the we are probably the second largest. Mm. Third uh, largest. Uh, the, third uh, largest down. Yeah, down, okay. Now, yeah. Uh, 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 importer of tea from Sri Lanka, uh, which is going to be affected because of sanctions, uh, because the same thing happened with Iran. How did you, how do you, and Iran was also one a large market. Uh, so how are you going to deal with that issue? How are you going to get your tea exports out? Mm. Uh, and also to a, a tourist destination, I mean, or, or a tourist, um, you know, arrivals from, from that region. 
Uh, I think in the last few months, we've seen that large number of tourists have come from Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so that is also going to have another impact on, on Sri Lanka. So I think uh, there'll be effects on multiple levels. But apart from that, also these other geopolitical tensions are going to impact because you're going to have uh, knock-on effects on other commodity prices like gas and the other food items as well. So you really don't know how this is going to play out in the, in uh, if this war kind of gets pro protracted. Yeah, Dr. Roshan, uh, <clears throat> I have a question for you now. Uh, just uh, moving away from uh, the Russian uh, Ukrainian crisis for the moment, uh, focusing our attention on the International Monetary Fund, uh, if they came into play uh, when the opposition parties as well as uh, the Sudan Chamber of Commerce uh, vociferously told the government to engage with the IMF um, as a way to move forward as far as to resurrect the country's economy was concerned as well as exchange rates. Do you think if we did that a couple of months ago, today we wouldn't have witnessed long queues at petrol stations, there won't be a gas shortage, there won't be a milk powder crisis, there won't be a sugar problem, there will be dal, wheat and whatever we need for our essential daily activities at the supermarket. Do you think the situation would have been different? So, so you have to look at it like this. I mean, basically, the reason why we are facing these shortages, there are two major reasons, actually. One is there is excess demand. Uh, basically, there is excess demand in the, in the economy. Um, for many reasons, as I think I said this before, money supply has been growing at one of the highest rates. Um, and, and the money printing by the central bank has has brought in money into the system. Huge money currency in, currency circulating in the economy is at a very high level. So obviously people have there is more money demand, uh, chasing too few goods. So it, there is excess demand there. The other one is the tax cuts. You remember in 2019 there were huge tax cuts. Mm. Uh, so in, for two years basically the government has lost something like 500 to 600 billion uh, rupees uh, each year annually. Some, it, th that money is in the hands of somebody, uh, which means that too is creating this excess demand. So these are some reasons why demand is high in the economy. The other one is remittances, because we say remittances in terms of dollars has, has not increased, or it's actually declined. But you're, you're not seeing people complaining, saying, saying that they are not receiving their remittances. So the remittances are coming some way. Uh, it may be not be coming in, in through official channels, yeah. it could be coming through unofficial channels, it could be coming, it could be rupees, right, transmitted through rupees. So, so there is cash in the economy, which mm. means that there is sufficient, not sufficient, but sorry, there is excess cash in the economy, which is driving a lot of these shortages, because people have money to spend. That is one thing. The other one is the pricing mechanism. We, we basically have this system of administered prices, right? We, we fix prices on everything. So you've seen one of the reasons for the shortages. We've had fixed prices for rice, fixed prices for sugar, fixed prices for dal, tin fish, uh, everything. I mean, not everything, but you know, all these commodities that you're talking about, we've had fixed prices, including for fuel, for gas. And as a result, when, when there is an uh, issue, um, because of the because of the dollar crisis, or rather the exchange rate crisis, uh, and and importers are unable to to supply uh, these goods at that administered price. Naturally, they have to reduce the amount that they import, or or, or stop imports altogether, which means that you have a shortage of goods. So we are we are interfering in this pricing mechanism, which is resulting in shortage. And I, I don't know anybody who has done economics 101 would know. That if you have, you know, there is a yeah. there is a market equilibrium price, right? Where where the market clears, where, where there is demand and supply, you go and fix that price below the market price. You're obviously going to create Dr. shortages. Roshan, Dr. Roshan, these prices were not announced by people with a rightful mind. We we saw in 2020 when President Kotabaya Rajpaksa addressed the nation. He's the one who came up with this mechanism to impose uh, control prices on dal, sugar, tin, canned fish and so on and so forth. So, however, predominantly the Sri Lankan political culture has been that. Don't you think so? It has always been through control price mechanisms to win the hearts and minds of the rural voter. But we also know the impact of those 
price controls, they have not lasted long. I mean, everybody comes and says they'll give bread at this price and flour at that price and rice at that price. But it never lasts long because always it ends up with a shortage because either the government doesn't have the funds to provide the, the commodity at that price or there's a, or a huge shortage is created. Now look at Dr. Rosha, I just want to give a classic example. Let's take a look at um, the fertilizer crisis in Sri Lanka. Uh, when when the fertilizer crisis happened, uh, the Minister of Agriculture, Mahindra Dalgamage, said that not not a, not one grain of rice will be imported to Sri Lanka, and that we will be self-sufficient. However, right now we are seeing rice coming from India. The deal that I, I hear, the deal that uh, they <coughs> wanted to go ahead and bring down one uh, one million metric tons of rice from China didn't work out. However. Uh, steps were taken to import rice from other nations, whether it's organic or non-organic, was not the question mark at the end of the day. So, don't you think the government is held responsible for these decisions that have been taken, haphazard decisions, arrogant decisions that have been taken with regard to the country's economy over the last few months? So, so I would say it's not just only a few last few months. I think this has happened periodically. Mm. We've had periodic governments putting, you know, uh, caps on uh, on prices. Fuel pricing is a classic example, right? We've always had this cap on fuel, and every time the fuel prices, you know, international fuel, because we are obviously import dependent, we don't produce any fuel. Every time fuel prices go up in the international markets, we continue to maintain our fuel. No, but Dr. Roshan, I don't know whether you recollect when Mangal Samarvira, the former Minister of Finance, brought in the fuel price formula, many in the opposition criticized it. See, this is not the way to go about. This is going to tax the people. But right now, the government is discussing about bringing forth a fuel price formula. Even the minister, even Ajitimar Kabra, who was um, uh, the state minister of capital markets, now who is the governor, is saying that there has to be a sharp increase in fuel prices and electricity bills in the country. Uh, yes, so that's definitely the case because, I mean, if you look at how the, the pricing at the moment, uh, I, I think the other day the the the, uh, the chairman of the CEO, not chairman, the, the, um, the, uh, uh, who is the, the DG, DG, I think, of the, CB, uh, the CPC came out and basically he gave out some numbers. Basically, we are losing something like 53 rupees. Yes. This is as, as at February, according to the February international prices, we are losing something like 50 rupees per liter of diesel and we are losing something like 21 rupees per, per liter of petrol. Kerosene is also very high but okay let's not even go there. So how can, I mean this this is translating into losses for the CPC. Same with the CEB because of the current uh, energy mix that we are we are faced with because of the uh, weather situation and, and our, you know we've had to Go for more, go more into thermal power generation, so both coal and uh, uh, and uh, oil uh, thermal power. Basically, we are the cost of generation is something like 29 rupees, where, whereas we're selling uh, a unit of electricity at 16.5 percent on average. This is, and we haven't changed these energy prices since 2014. So, imagine the losses that we're making for every unit of of energy. Uh, in addition to that, we have a whole, like, something like more than a million domestic consumers pay something like only 60 rupees in terms of electricity and one more than again another million consumers paying something like 200 rupees per month for electricity. So it's, it, 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 it's good, access to electricity is, is good, we need to have access to electricity but it has to be continuous access and that continuous access can only be made if we price it correctly. So I think, I mean, this, this has been a peri perennial problem. And I think even now, at least we should use this crisis to, to realize that we have to start pricing uh, whatever, we, whatever we, we, we consume, whatever we, we produce uh, at, at, at the, at the pr cost reflective prices. And we cannot keep subsidizing these. If, I mean, if, if we need to uh, support uh, because I, I think the World Bank had done a study uh, where they showed actually that it's really 30, the top 30 percent of households really benefit from something like the 70 percent of fuel that is the subsidy that is given because they are the ones who really drive the big vehicles and drive and, and use most of the <coughs> fuel consumption because it's the, the bottom uh, households only <coughs> use public transportation and there you know the subsidy component yeah. is much less. 
So actually it will be more cost effective to give a direct tra cash transfer to those you know, poorer households or the lower income households uh, to, to support them because of these, you know, you, obviously they will have some impact if you're going to have some price adjustments and remove the subsidies. Why are you subsidizing people who can afford to pay, pay for fuel and or electricity or whatever? Um, Bhavani, I'd like to, uh, we were talking about the Easter attacks earlier and uh, I think in the aftermath of the Easter attacks we've seen uh, some of the most widespread uh, misuse or let's say abuse of the Prevention of Terrorism Act uh, in the last few years. Uh, a couple of days ago, women's rights activist Shreen Sarur had written an had published an article uh, where she talked about the impact that the, pre that the PTA is having on women, uh, not just women detainees, but also the uh, the partners and uh, mothers, sisters of men who have been detained under PTA. And in this patriarchal system that we have, how they're being forced to sell valuables, uh, marry off teenage daughters. Uh, there was a there was one incident she had mentioned where a TID officer had gone into uh, this woman's house and confis confiscated the sewing machine, mm. uh, which was her sole uh, means of income, uh, claiming that it had been used to sew uh, bomb vests. Uh, we never really look at the PTA from this lens when talking about the impact that it has on women. What are your thoughts? Do you agree with what Shreen is saying? Definitely, Nadeem. And it's good you raised it. And actually, Harini also raised it in Parliament, this whole issue, because we speak about laws and its impact in terms of particular groups, individuals. And with the PTA, we a lot of the times look at the detainees. And that's a very important point because over the decades, now the PT has been in force for over 40 years, um, it's had such a significant impact on the detainees and the way it's being used, the abuse, all of that. That's so important to look at. But a lot of the times we forget how families have been affected, how communities have been affected. and. Easter Sunday, I think, was a good example. The Easter Sunday attacks and the subsequent violence and how the PTA, but also other laws like the ICCPR Act, have been used to target, again, I come back to a particular group of people, a particular community, and that impact. So Shreen talks about, and several others talk about how women have been affected in terms of having to become the sole breadwinner, um, the economic hardships, but also the stigma, the pushback. Mm. I mean, th the levels of um, hardships is just very, I think it's very important to look at. But this is also not just post Easter Sunday, it's been there for so many decades. And I think that's something we need to talk about because it's e in a way it's easier to talk about detainees' rights. And it's a very important issue. But what about the larger segment of society that gets impacted by this? Um, and how do you address that in terms of economic hardships but also social, social stigma but also social hardships? Um, and you know, recently. Case in point being the suffering that uh, Dr. Shafi's wife and kids had to go Dr. through. Dr. Shafi's in the wife, but, but so many others. You know, we talk about some of the more high profile cases, and quite rightly, you know, you talk about Dr. Shafi, you Hijaz. talk about Hijaz, you talk about Aknaf, and very rightly, they were targeted. But there are so and, many others who've been so there. And so many others, hundreds of others, some lost in the system, some detained for decades that get forgotten and I think that's very important to look at the other cases but you know I also want to just say PTA has been abused and for decades but also look at other laws ICCPR Ramzi Razik's case is a good example a well-known case but there are others but how the penal code also is being used you know even Shaktika Satkumar exactly so 
Uh, there are so many other laws that are being used to target individuals, but at the same time I want to put this also, how particularly individuals. Now, incitement is being the, the reason they say some people are being arrested and detained using PTO ICCPR. But how some individuals, particularly from the majority community, are not mm. facing that same reaction. So I, I, what I'm saying is that a particular communities are getting targeted, but then also the selective use of the law to target individuals, to weaponize it in terms of particular groups, particularly individuals and critics. So I think that's a point that needs to Dr. be Dr. Priyanjali, I think what what, uh, what Babani is basically Another articulating I just want to pose a question to Dr. Harini and then come back to... It's on the same thread. Right, I'll right, come right, to Dr. Right. Harini as well. Uh, Dr. Piansley, what I want to... What Babani is basically articulating is sort of uh, the state uh, systematically using laws to uh, mass traumatize uh, entire communities. What can we do for, for people who are who are, who are the victims of this? Because Bhavan is talking about, you know, the psychological trauma that uh, uh, not just these women, but these detainees, their families, uh, their children have to go through the stigma. Uh, and why isn't it that we're seeing uh, more of a pushback from the uh, professional uh, community? Let's say, for example, I, as far as I know, I haven't seen anything from uh, the College of Psycho Psychologists for regarding uh, these somewhat sometimes perceived as controversial matters. I don't think I quite get your question. Could you clarify? The question is what can we do about this? From your, uh, as a professional psychologist, we haven't really seen, because what Bhavani articulated there is basically mass traumatization of entire communities. Uh, in the form of laws? Yeah, where laws are being abused to traumatize, in a systematic mm. sense, mm. Uh, entire communities. Uh, from I, the psychological problem, what, because this, this, this kind of trauma can have like a generational mm. effect. Mm -hmm. uh, so what you're saying? What do we need to be doing? Mm. So the first question is, in the event that this is actually happening, why isn't that the professional community, such as psychologists, saying something or issuing a statement? Yeah, something. Mm. Well, that's a good question. I'm sure in other p countries where the professions are more developed, that can happen. But I never thought about that. We do have a Sri Lanka Psychological Association and its infancy. We are still grappling with the most basic, such as the membership prizes, mm. you see. So as well as getting it acknowledged by the Sri Lankan government for the last 20 years. So for us to even get on together as a community, as a profession has been tough, but that is not an excuse for what you're saying. We can certainly uh, issue statements, but that has not happened. And the reasons could be many. Do you feel that there is definitely a need for the community to contribute towards this conversation? Yes, I think in the event that these uh, statements are substantiated with evidence, and if that is so, yes. Now, for example, in US, particularly where the psychology community is very well established, in times where there are issues like this, the community, for example, the, the American Psychological Association would press, they would issue statements. And they're very powerful bodies, these professional bodies, which then has an impact on the politics of that country. So issuing such a statement is important, but it has not happened in our country so far. Yeah. Dr. Harini, uh, I know that there has been a drive uh, amongst more, uh, I think, primarily driven by the TNA to uh, call for the a signature campaign to call for the repeal of the Prevention of Terrorism Act. Uh, and we've seen uh, members, certain members of parliament sort of supporting that and members of civil society as well. Uh, what I want to know is, can you recall, because I can't, who was the last person that was convicted under the PTA? This, this, this. 
So maybe Bhavani can answer that better than I can. I certainly because don't I was wondering. Know I mean, a law yeah. needs Who's to be been useful. Convicted. Right? I mean, most because of them if are all you're doing is detaining and yeah. remanding people yes. Yes. for decades or years without charge, yeah. and if you haven't had a conviction of actual like terrorism charges, yeah. then what use is this law? I mean, there's been convictions. I would say the most maybe high profile is Tisanagam who Tisanagam, was convicted yes. and convicted. 20 years yeah. and for doing his work as a journalist yeah. so I mean that's a very well known but there are others as well so the the, the PTA has been used to convict mm. but it's also been used more as a as a, a, as a weapon, weapon. Uh, in but, terms I think of it's, but I think Dr. Arun is I think it's funny that for example we remember Tisanagam's mm. conviction but I think it's funny that we have that as a conviction it's hip we're against terrorism. We have this law that's given us this one pro high profile conviction. No, I'm sure there have been so no, many there's, there's high more. profile there's more. people yeah. being <laughs> detained, remanded, harassed. More specifically, let me ask you, we've seen yeah. from opposition parties, uh, we're unsure what the Sami Janabalavega's stance is when it comes to repealing the PTA. Maybe they're more pro reform. But as a group, the Women's Parliamentary Caucus, the Women's Caucus in Parliament. Do you all have a position? I know I shouldn't be asking you since Dr. Sudarshini is the head of the caucus, but have you all discussed this? Do these no. issues come up in discussion? <clears throat> no. Uh, certainly the PTA has not been discussed in the caucus and I doubt there being consensus within the uh, the caucus on, on, on the PTA because, you know, they would reflect the uh, the uh, the views of the political party, the the uh, uh, members of parliament representing the caucus. So, we've not discussed it, and I doubt there being consensus on it. Even with the issues that I'm talking about, that <coughs> Sreen has highlighted in an article from a couple of days ago regarding the impact that this is mm -hmm. having on women in this country. Uh, even with that, you feel that the partisan lines will not be crossed. I I I am afraid so because I think it's become such a politically uh, sensitive issue, the, the idea of a terrorist, the idea of uh, who is held, uh, you know, who is uh, subjected to the, uh, to the PTA is, is very, it's very political, mm. it's very political, right? So I, I and, and uh, the women in the caucus, apart from uh, uh, Dr. Sudarshini Fernando Pule and Talata Korale and Rohini Kaviratna, the others, I think all, all of us, the other nine, are first time, so backbenchers, right? Don't have that level of uh, pushback that they can actually articulate a position that is perhaps somewhat contrary to the position that their, their party holds. I don't think it would be easy for, for many of the backbenchers in the caucus to do that. That is quite a uh, sad It is very sad. Affairs, it is very sad. It is very sad, but it's. It, I think we have to acknowledge uh, the, the reality, right? Uh, it is very sad that there there aren't more that, that the politics, the political culture has become so toxic that it makes cross-party collaboration extremely difficult. And you see that in the in the debates in Parliament, right? Where you're sort of hurling insults at each other. Sort but of we did see that, for example, other. the incident that Shamir was referring to earlier involving uh, Tissa Kutiarachi. We did see the women's caucus yes. taking I mean, a I unified think stand. If, we, if the women's caucus hadn't stood up to that issue, we should have dissolved immediately, right? That was such a blatant uh, act of violence against one of our members. I think if we had failed to speak up then, we really shouldn't. We don't. We shouldn't. Ex you know, come together. Do you together see a future a for the women's caucus in Parliament in sort of driving policy changes, in actively taking on issues as a, uh, as a movement within Parliament? We try, but I think twelve members is is not a not big enough. enough number to have a to make a huge voice in Parliament. Uh, I am very grateful to Dr. Fernando Pulle for her leadership. I think she does make may, uh, make a lot of effort into into keeping the caucus going and to sort of initiate uh, certain things. Uh, but it's 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 very very difficult. We actually have a standing committee on um, 
uh, gender equity and equality uh, which is which you know, is broader than the women's caucus it also involves male parliamentarians uh, but then again uh, those meetings uh, are very badly attended but by those who are appointed. So, uh, so. Dr. Haridi, when, you, when, 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 we, when we heard the statement that was made by uh, Dr. Fernandipulla in parliament mm -hmm. with regard to the statement that was made by parliamentarian Sukuti Arachi, she could not demand an apology from the member of parliament. That did not happen. No, that did not happen. That did not happen. I think the fact that she even made that statement and that she uh, along with uh, uh, Talatatu Korala, Rohini Kaviratna and I met the speaker on the issue was significant given the, given the partisan way in which uh, people generally act in parliament that was quite, quite significant. So right? we speak about the parliamentary activities, uh, Dr. Harine, I think Nadim brought in the fact about the PTA where the convictions have taken place. I want to bring to your attention the COOP committees. Mm. Uh, this has been uh, initiated in the, in, on the 21st of July 1979. Tell me one conviction uh, of, of any of the irregularities that has taken place at COOP where you all have discussed it extensively identified by COP. By COP. And brought to book, tell me one incident? I certainly, well, the, I certainly don't know of any. As you know, the bond scam uh, 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 <laughs> case that was, uh, that has also, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the case has now, you know, I mean, they've been released from released the case, from right? The certain oh, charges. charges. Certain charges. Certain charges. Yeah, certain charges. Business. So, so this is one of the problems actually that with COP, COP I mean the other uh, public finance, the other oversight committee, the financial oversight committees in parliament, there's very little teeth for these committees to actually pursue an inquiry. All we can make are recommendations or request for members to uh, come and give evidence or to sort of inquire and investigate into what happened. The rest of the, the conviction, the trial has to happen through the uh, mm -hmm. process of, you know, the law enforcement. And that's where there's always a bottleneck. And once again, if you, if you look at the cases that have not been convicted, that are going really slow, those are the cases that have the most amount of political significance, because the most amount of political time, influence. Every single time, the parliament either is adjourned or every four years a new committee on public yeah. enterprise is formed, all these issues that have been discussed extensively at COPE is swept under the carpet. Yeah, I mean, uh, Shamin, I want to just share this with you today. Uh, 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 actually, several, t there are often members of these uh, public institutions who get in touch with us who are really upset by the kind of things that they have to deal with the corruption that they see and they have such huge expectations that parliament will be able to support some of their initiatives to sort of you know turn back this these these corrupt cases right or the, the, the investigations are, so there are really honest people in these systems also who feel very let down by the fact that uh, you know their honesty is not not upheld their honesty is not rewarded and the corrupt uh, are able to get away with things like this, right? So I think I mean this is this is one of the major failures of our of our parliament, our inability to really. I mean, financial oversight is one right. of the so, major uh, roles of parliament. Uh, right? Dr. Harani, now getting back into the future of the NPP, and now people are talking about whether NPP is the next political force in Sri Lanka because they've really got fed up of the ruling two political parties that is the um, SLPP now and the uh, SJB now and then um, the SLFP as well as the uh, UNP. People have somewhat got disgruntled about the activities of these political um, organizations, political parties. Now they're looking up to the NPP as an option, as an alternative. Now you are representing the NPP. Do you think your leader has the political experience, administrative capability to take leadership, to steer Sri Lanka to the next level because we thought, or the 6.9 million people who voted in favor of Gotabe Rajapaksa thought that he would be the person who could steer Sri Lanka in the right direction. Today when we see the long queues 
the administrative discrepancies that are taking place? The answer is very evident. I don't want to say whether it's good or bad, but the answer is out there. So do you think your leader, Anur Kumar Sanayaka, has that capability? Well, so? this, I certainly think he does. I think he's, he's one of, I, I mean, he, he certainly has the capacity, he's demonstrated that ab ability, he functioned as a minister for, for a while and he's led a party for several years, right? So I, I think he's demonstrated the, uh, his ability. Certainly the 6.9 didn't pick Gotab Rajapaksa for his uh, political acumen or his uh, administrative capacity, right? I don't think those were the reasons why he was elected. Uh, so I think that's where we really have a lot of work to do with citizen education on, 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 uh, on, on, on political education of citizens in how we choose our leaders, right? We seem to sort of uh, make choices based on kind of uh, on images of people rather than a real assessment of their ability and I think this is not a problem that's unique to Sri Lanka. We've seen this happening in other parts of the world as well and I think it, this, this crisis in a way is a moment for us to also really reflect on the re on the responsibility of citizens yeah, Dr. in, in this about, political process. You spoke about the capabilities mm. of uh, Anur Kumar Nisanayaka while he was uh, sitting in as mm. a um, in the cabinet mm. uh, of the Chandrika mm. uh, uh, Naika uh, Kumar mm. Singh government. I want to drag your attention to one of the projects that he initiated while he was Minister of Education. That was the Vau Dahasak mm. program. Mm which was dubbed as a total failure mm. uh, at that time. Mm. Uh, so how do you say that he has the experience, he has the political will to steer the country because that project was just a sheer waste of money, <coughs> nothing concrete to place subsequently? Um, I think that's debatable. Uh, during his term, he was in uh, he was cabinet minister for one. I was. And a half. I took just one 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 project yeah. that he initiated. One and a half years, and I believe about three hundred odd uh, 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 reservoirs were were resurrected uh, were repaired during that time and reconstructed. Uh, certainly, it didn't meet the target, right? And it uh, possibly the time that he, that uh, that he was minister wasn't sufficient for that. But there were other things he did while he was a cabinet minister which proved to be really effective like the work he did with Milko or turning around the, uh, the fortunes of, uh, of the ministry at that time, right? So I think he's there. And also, um, I think one of the Dabe key... Raja Pax was very successful when he was the chairman of the Urban Development Authority and the Defence Secretary of the country. I think it's very different being a secretary to a ministry and being a minister and that's what I wanted to actually get to. Mm in the sense that I think we really need to s select people with political acumen, political knowledge and political experience of, of, uh, of actually knowing and understanding how politics works because at the end of the day ministers, presidents and prime elected representatives are, have political work to do and unless you have that experience and acumen, political acumen, I think you can land yourself in a real mess and I think Let's we... Let's take a look at the US for an example. Uh, well, yes, exactly. Uh, so, if Donald Trump was in power, many are of the opinion that you, uh, Russia may have not invaded. Uh, I think that's Russia. highly debatable. I think that's highly debatable, Shamin. I mean, uh, had Donald Trump been in charge in this moment in time, can you imagine? I, I, I mean, I dread to think of what uh, disasters the world could have been facing. He would have probably pressed the nuclear button and we would have all been vaporized by now, right? <laughs> so, I mean, I think that's not a path or that's certainly not, uh, Wait, that not a path to follow. Were there were discussions about uh, people in politics uh, should be uh, should be thrown out. Uh, people with a uh, business acumen should come into the p into play. But it and hasn't that, that was the trend at that time? Yeah, but I think the world world has proved that to be uh, that experiment to have been a dismal failure. We've learned it. The U.S. has learned it, right? And I think there's a huge lesson here to learn uh, that running a company is not the same as running a country. Being a uh, secretary of a ministry is certainly not a qualification 
or enough to uh, judge a person's competence to run a country. At least we know it now. <laughs> At least we know it now. So let's not repeat <laughs> those mistakes. Right. Um, so, uh, Dr. Roshan, um, I want to drag your attention to the policy interest rates that were revised um, by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka just a couple of uh, days ago. Uh, it was uh, uh, revised to 7.50. Uh, many are of the opinion that this was not uh, taken into taking into account the market forces. When there is double digit inflation in the country, policy interest rates cannot be on a single digit. What is your thoughts on this? Yes, so once again, uh, I think we've been waiting for policy interest rates to be tightened. There was a certain sort of from last year, the other inter market interest rates were allowed to move up a little bit, but then again they were fixed. So yes, certainly it's not enough, but the, it was a hundred basis point increase. You can't, you know, increase it, you know, in one go in five hundred basis points or whatever. So as I said, I hope this is the start, but it's not the end. That we will continue to raise interest rates because even if you look at interest rates now, just as you said, uh, it, it we raised it only. The standard standing deposit facility is at 6.5, right. 6 yes. the lending facility is at 7.5, mm. but as we know, inflation is running at 15, 16, basically double digits, but even if you look at expected inflation, it's expected to be at least double digits. Dr. Roshan, now, now, the governor of the central bank, Dr. Ajit Mivad Cabral, has always been of the opinion that getting the IMF to the country may lead to us taking uh, very uh, austerity measures uh, in terms of the country's economy. Right now, aren't we facing all that? Now, just today, just a couple of hours ago, uh, the exchange rate was somewhat floated. I wouldn't say floated per se, but at least relaxed at 230 against the US dollar. Uh, then we see uh, in the next few weeks, uh, the government will have to take decisions in terms of increasing the fuel prices because they wouldn't be able to um, a supply fuel at 130 US dollars a barrel in the longer run. Even the Indian oil company would uh, not give the Sri Lankan uh, Sipetco uh, uh, diesel or petrol at the prices that, I have, that they want at. In a situation like that, don't you think we are in some way moving towards all the decisions that the IMF would have imposed and we are not reaping the benefit of getting engaged with the IMF, unfortunately. So, so I think you can't look at the IMF as you know, the, as the only institution that you know comes up with these. No, that is the big one. Yeah. Uh, I think loans. you, if you, yeah. if you spoke to any economist in Sri Lanka, they would have told you a similar thing, and you probably heard it, right? Most macroeconomics, macroeconomists talked about these things. Uh, and as I said, you had to address this excess demand factor or aggregate demand in the economy. You had to do something with the market prices. So tightening monetary policy, uh, increasing taxes, uh, reducing the deficit financing. So basically the central bank <coughs> financing of the deficit, revising energy prices, depreciating the exchange rate. I mean, all those things were uh, articulated by any any self-respecting e economist would have told you that. So, so there is not I mean what the IMF comes and tells you is not some magic bullet uh, or some magic you know recipe it, it's something that macroeconomics know anybody who studies the economy knows that these things have to be done I think the important factor about getting the IMF involved and getting the IMF you know to, to engage uh, with Sri Lanka is something beyond that um, quite apart from all these you know problems that we're facing in the macroeconomy we know that you know the elephant in the room and the big looming uh, what is looming over us is our debt situation right we've got to repay this huge debt mm. annually uh, till 2025 so right. basically mm. unless we start doing some kind of restructuring uh, we are going to we are not going to be able to get out of this problem i mean there'll be temporary fixes we can do all these things but still we're going to have this problem of having to, how are we going to raise the dollars to repay that but dr Roshan, now Right now, this year, we have to make a payment of seven billion U.S. dollars in debt repayment. How much do we have in the kitty at the moment? Probably, I mean, less than less than a billion dollars, I would think. And even out of that, you don't know how much usable reserves are. So it's it's down to 
probably a few weeks. So that that's what I'm coming so to. How so are we going to pay this <laughs> if the uh, governor of the central bank is of the opinion the debt won't be restructured because a couple of weeks ago he said that we are ready to pay uh, in July uh, our international commitments. Um, I just don't understand because any grade one or grade two student would know <laughs> that uh, when you have to make a payment of seven billion or seven rupees to someone, let's make it very simple so the governor also understands uh, the arithmetic behind it. So if you have to pay seven rupees uh, to someone and if you have only one rupee with you, how are you going to pay that? Now, does the governor understand this? So also you must look back and no, see. No, does the this governor understand this? I, I, well, well, I can't, I can't read his mind, question. but I, I can't I, read I didn't even talk in billions, just rupees. Uh, but yeah. what I have to say is you've got to see some of the statements that were made in the past and, and the actions that have been taken uh, recently. Uh, finally, the, the decisions that have been made, but unfortunately, they come too late. So, so going back to your question of, of repayments, yes, we, we have another billion dollars that have to be paid in July. Uh, again, to come back to my analogy and say, okay, if we pay that billion dollars, basically, we are going to deprive ourselves of one year of medicine, uh, four years of fertilizer, uh, uh, three, uh, yeah, so three years of, uh, I mean, basically, we, we, we could do so many other things with it if we don't pay uh, that one billion dollars. So I think I think we need to be careful and mm. figure out how, how we are going to use the limited resources we have uh, for the benefit of the people of this country. What is going to benefit the people of this country? Dr. Roshanpur, how long have you been with the central? 20 years with the central bank? Uh, one year short, yes. One, so, uh, okay, so, so, so nearly uh, 20 years. So let's, let's put, it, uh, put, put that figure uh, to the forefront for the moment, 20 years. In your time at the central bank, has the governor and the minister of finance had a good relationship? Or have they always fought like this? Because I don't understand what is going on right now. Because Kamal Veda once also said that uh, the governor and uh, the minister of finance have uh, not met. Uh, they, the governor had requested a time slot. This is the mini what the minister said had requested for a time start for six months and he has not been able to meet the finance minister. So has there always been a tug of war? So I have to say uh, the, the, the monetary board comprises of five people. The governor is the chair. There are three independent members. But the secretary of the treasury sits on the monetary board and the monetary board meets every uh, once in two weeks. So the Ministry of Finance is always represented on the on the Ministry of Fi uh, on the monetary board. So I don't think uh, either party can say that they have not had an opportunity to speak to each other or to convey a message because the secretary to the treasury who's a who's the CEO basically of the treasury uh, is a member of the monetary board which is the which is the apex body which is actually the decision making body in the central bank and who is actually responsible uh, for uh, macroeconomic management uh, under the monetary law act um, which governs the central bank so I don't think that is really uh, so all this so all this uh, the statement that was issued um, on the 4th of March 2022 uh, the economic and financial advisor the central bank wishes to advise the government to diligently consider introducing measures to discourage non-essential and non-urgent imports urgently increasing fuel prices and electricity tariffs immediately incentivizing uh, foreign remittances and investments further implementing energy conservation measures Increasing government revenue through suitable tax increase on a sustained basis. Mobilizing foreign financing and non-debt forex inflows on a regular urgent basis. Monetizing the non-strategic and underutilized assets. And postponing non-essential and non-urgent capital projects. The Minister of Finance is well aware. So, so I would say apart from that, so under the, the monetary law... Just a, just a drama as I said before. Just to tell the people, we have taken the decision. Now it's the onus is on the... Minister of Finance, yes, beside. But 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 I don't think the central bank can also wash its hands of the responsibility because under the Monetary Law Act, under several sections, there's section 64, section 68, and section 65, the the central bank is, or the rather the Monetary Board actually, uh, is is has a responsibility to inform the minister in charge of 
of finances, which is usually is the Minister of Finance. Uh, and when certain things happen in the economy, so one is if money supply goes beyond 15%, if inflation goes beyond 10%, uh, if they feel that they, uh, the deficit in the BOP is such that uh, there is a serious decline in international reserves, they have to uh, uh, submit a report to the Minister of Finance. Every month this is, right? Every month that these, these things uh, occur, they have to submit a report to the, to the Minister of Finance. Uh, informing them about what has happened, uh, what policies have been adopted by them and what uh, remedial action has been taken by the central bank or the board, what the board has taken and what other further measures, either monetary or fiscal or administrative ma measures that need to be taken to address these issues. So I don't think uh, either party can really uh, wash their hands of this. Uh, they, uh, they, under the X, I mean, there is a serious responsibility for the central bank and the bond. However, uh, in 2011, uh, Dr. Roshan, uh, if you may recollect right, when uh, Mahindra Rajapaksa in his capacity as the Minister of Finance was uh, making or tabling the budget, uh, the budget is usually about fiscal policy of the country. It's, it's nothing to do with monetary policy of the country. However, President uh, Mahindra Rajapaksa, in his budget speech, uh, went on to speak about the depreciation of the Sri Lankan rupee against the US dollar. And uh, at that time, there seemed to have been an issue with uh, Dr. P.B. Jayasundara and uh, Ajit Nibhat Kabral uh, as the governor of the central bank. So we've seen such political tug of war taking place during the Rajapaksa regime that has been in power. So, do you recollect that happening? Yeah, yes, I do. Yeah. And uh, I think you should go back and see where the exchange rate was at that time and how the exchange rate was being managed and why this needed to be done. But I think at this juncture, I, I, I think we need to stop playing games. I think somebody else said that as well. Uh, we are at a critical juncture. I think uh, all we have to put, put away our political differences, put away our ideological differences and come together as a country because this is in the best interest of us, best interest of future generations, because we know what happens to countries that go into a default or go into a crisis uh, or a sovereign debt crisis. It doesn't stop there. It can even uh, even go into your uh, affect your, your banks, your financial sector. And then the, the impact is much higher. So I think it is I, I think we really need to put away whatever differences As we are and come together and try to see how we can best solve this with the least amount of pain to people. As the imprisoned Ranjan Ramanayaka once said opposite um, the uh, the Supreme Court complex, they are all friends. <laughs> Why can't they fight it out and you know solve the problems out? No, Dr. Roshan. You don't want to comment on that? <laughs> anyway, I want to move my attention to um, uh, Bhavani Fonseca, human rights advocate and attorney at law. Uh, Bhavani, you said something very interesting uh, uh, to one of the questions that I posed to you earlier. You said that uh, we have been um, going back and forth the United Nations Human Rights Council now for over a decade. Uh, however, let's look at the issues that uh, the world has faced and they have not even been able to come for a proper resolve yet. Let's look at the 1994, uh, the apartheid issue uh, in mm -hmm. South Africa. We're still talking about it. We're still debating about it. Uh, the racist issues in, uh, in the United States, we're still discussing about it. We're still debating about it. Ten years? Does it make a big difference? Of course it does. I mean, we are talking about people's lives. So you, you can't compare it to other countries and say just because it's taking so long in those countries, we should take as long. Mm. I mean, let's be realistic. In 2009, um, a couple of weeks after the end of the war, the then president, now prime minister, signed a joint communique with the then UN secretary general saying reconciliation, accountability, there'll be a solution to this country. Now, why has that not happened? Uh, I mean, we have the same actors in the political landscape even now. So it's more than a decade, actually. Just forget the HRC, actually. The Human Rights Council took on Sri Lanka because things were not working in the country. 
we've had continuous and successive governments have appointed commissions of inquiry. Let, let's take, Bhavani, that I take your point for the moment at this, uh, at this very moment only. Uh, let's take a look at the UK for an example. When uh, Tony Blair decided to uh, invade Afghanistan in 2001 and then subsequently yeah. uh, invade uh, Iraq, uh, he came out and said that they did not have any concrete evidence of weapons of mass destruction in uh, Iraq. However, what did the United Nations Human Rights Commission do about it? No, Isn't it what did the Human Rights Commission do about those statements that was made by Tony Blair years after? Mm. Uh, being uh, being retired as the British Prime Minister. Well, what measures have they taken? Shamir, I don't think you should look at the Human Rights Council as going to solve all the problems. The Human Rights Council is one actor in the international arena. I mean, if you look at the Ukraine situation, the Secu Security Council has not been able to pass a resolution because Russia vetoed it. Then you move it to the UN General Assembly. You had last week the Human Rights Council pass a resolution. Now the International Criminal Court, the prosecutor is saying he's starting an investigation. You have different actors. Is that going to solve a problem in a country? Those are particular pressure points. That's not it. End of the day, it comes back to the country. It comes back to a country which has a democratically elected government that should be actually delivering on these things. We shouldn't always be looking to the international community and the international forum but that is, as the answer. Yeah, but that is the general notion, even with this government. We saw Minister of Human Rights um, uh, many years ago, Mahinda Samar Singh, addressing the United Nations Human Rights Council session, said, do not. Uh, pelt stones by sitting inside glass houses. I still recollect this statement mm -hmm. that was made by Mahinda Samar Singh now who is the ambassador to the US. Uh, so doesn't this really reflect to the activities of the West and then why corner Sri Lanka? This is a general notion that the people have. What is the answer you have for those people? Look, I'm not speaking to the human rights violations and the record of other countries. Mm -hmm. I think there are lots of problems in all the countries. Tell me one country that doesn't have problems. End of the day, we need to look at what the problems are here. How do you best resolve those problems? Now, we have an election every few years. We have a parliament. We have institutions. What sadly has been happening is that we have, uh, over the years, the executive presidency has become stronger and stronger. We have now the most powerful executive president who really should be able to solve all these problems because that was the platform he came on. Now, we can talk about the violations and the problems in other countries, but when you have a government that promised so much, mm. promised so much and went in 2019 and 2020 said, give us more power because that's how we're going to solve this. And 2022, we are in an unprecedented situation. So leave aside that the countries, why is it that we can't get our house in order? Yeah, so uh, uh, Bhavani, uh, I've covered uh, as a journalist a lot of issues with regard to reconciliation, human rights and all that and more. What I've noticed is that scars left behind by the conflict need to heal and takes time. You need to not uh, open them, fester them, and uh, continue to uh, uh, capitalize on it for political gain of NGOs and other organizations per se. If that case be the scenario, what is the resolve that we can give to the Tamil-speaking people in Sri Lanka with regard to uh, with regard to finding a resolution to the issues that they have faced. Because not only the Tamil speaking people of the country was affected by the war, even the Sikhna people were affected by the war. I can give you a classic example. Uh, a few years ago, uh, a DS uh, Sri College baseball team was entirely wiped out uh, because of a bomb blast uh, in Peta. Uh, not only the Tamil speaking people, mm. but also the Sikhna pe uh, speaking people lost their loved ones. Mm as a result of the war. So what is the resolve we have? This has, there has to be an end of the road, end of the tunnel. So what is, what, what, what is that? Where are we heading? So are we going to be speaking about this for many years? Or, yeah. or, or mustn't we all collectively get together, as Dr. Roshan said, with regard to the political situation mm. and the economic situation in the country? 
unite and find a common cause mm. because when I'm just telling you in 2015 when uh, President Maitri Parasir said came into power people thought there'll be concrete resolution to the Tamil speaking problem but that did not happen mm. and mm. at that time organizations like the CPA was not very vocal also I don't know why but it was not very vocal also I'm going to come back right okay that. right you can come back mm -hmm. <laughs> but 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 mustn't we all get together and find a proper concrete solution to this and sh shouldn't it be a homegrown solution i agree in that we need to all come together to find a solution and i agree that all citizens have been affected by the cycles of violence um but disproportionately there are particular communities who suffered in the past and who continue to suffer and we need to recognize that so why is it that so many decades later that we go back to this whole issue of discrimination marginalization and the fact that the root causes of the conflict have not been addressed if at all they've been sustained and revived under certain governments so you're right yahapalane government had this great opportunity to address a lot of these problems and they promised a lot as well mm. a new constitution transitional justice reconciliation Just all of that government. exactly so successive governments promise so much during campaign periods and they fail miserably so i think one of the lessons we need to learn from all these failed exper experiments <coughs> is that there's no plan you know you talk big at an election time but after that there's no plan and it's a very i mean harini raised this point about a very toxic political culture it's extremely polarized it's very political so it's about each parties or groups agenda so you know i think we are in a situation extremely unprecedented where the economic crisis is really getting people to recognize we need to come together in terms of addressing problems but i raise this point a lot of the times these problems are handled as separate issues you know there's a siloed approach we saw that even with the constitution drafting the constitution drafting got precedence over everything else <laughs> everything else was pushed aside now if we are to get another opportunity to address these problems the root causes of the conflict we can't have a siloed approach mm. we can't prioritize issues there has to be a plan so there's a lot of conversations that need to happen but fundamentally do we have the leadership do we have the political leadership to even get to that stage right. and i don't see that right uh, professor priyanjali uh, in my opening uh, question to you we spoke about women's issues um, we spoke about sexism we spoke about reproductive health um, gender based violence and all that and more how important is it for men uh, to participate in addressing these issues because it's just not a women's problem or women's issues that we're talking about there has to be men's participation as well do you agree with that in uplifting the status of women yes certainly they are the key people because we have to acknowledge that in many societies even in the most advanced gender wise uh, men do hold more power right so then if a sensitive man wants to uplift others he would certainly want to participate in uplifting the women whether or not they're sensitive to what's happening around the country at the moment is a big question mark with what we saw recently with um, Hirunika Premachandra's matter. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Pro Professor Priyanjali, however... There are variations in sensitivity depending on the person, isn't it? Depending on the person, indeed. Dr. Priyanjali, when you consider <coughs> uh, Sri Lanka's position, for example, on the Gender Inequality Index, I think we're 90th, something that score of about 0 0.4. When you look at the incidents that are happening from the highest house of public representation to the lowest from the Pradesh Sabha right up to Parliament. I mean, what we saw in Parliament uh, with that MP was a microcosm of a very bad picture around the country. When you look at, for example, the the 
the slogans that were being chanted that uh, former MP Hirnika Prem outside uh, former MP Hirnika Prem Chandra's house. I mean, you look at how women are being treated in general under this administration. Do you feel that uh, it is highly problematic that uh, we've had a couple of cabinet reshuffles now as well, but still there's no recognition uh, for uh, women's and children's affairs in cabinet. There's a state minister mm. of women's affairs who is still a man, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Alton. Do you find this highly problematic? Don't you find this highly problematic? The fact that the state minister is a man? That, well, not just that the state minister of women's affairs is a man, but that the subject of women's affairs in a country where women's affairs are so often ignored or only paid lip service to is not deemed worthy of uh, having a cabinet portfolio. Mm. Do you find that problematic? Not that it's a man. I mean, if, as you said, if it's a sensitive yeah. man, then maybe <laughs> ideally it should be a woman. Mm. Uh, if you have to appoint a man, <laughs> maybe you yeah. can have a sensitive find man. Sensitive. But yeah. do you find this problematic when you look at you know, the situations that we're facing, the, the increase I with COVID-19, we saw an increase in, in incidents of, of gender-based violence. Women. Uh, I was talking earlier about uh, sort of the ma mass trauma uh, that could be caused by uh, selective application of uh, the PTA, but we've also seen incidents uh, with, uh, with PTSD involving soldiers and uh, subsequent increases uh, uh, incidents of gender-based violence involving soldiers with PTSD. So, there are these issues that the government doesn't seem to <coughs> deem worthy mm. of their attention. I think... I, do you agree with that statement? Well, I wouldn't know whether we could say the government doesn't seem worthy. I think our society at large doesn't seem worthy. The government is simply a representation of what our society is like, isn't it? Because they are, I, I, for me, that is what. So if you just forget about the positions of what you call the government, and if you look at the society at large, they are not very sensitive. And I think when I first spoke, when you first asked me the questions, I spoke about women being there for women. <laughs> now, if you were to look at uh, parliamentary Hirunika situation, how many women were there too? Hmm. You see, so it is not only men who is an issue or the government who is an issue. It is also other segments of the population. So what I'm saying is that the situation that women find themselves in our country is a situation that so many people have contributed to, as opposed to one segment that we may be trying to highlight. Professor Priyanjali, uh, sorry, Dr. Priyan, uh, sorry, Azra, no. just one question for Dr. Priyanjali, and then uh, you can you can, you can have a uh, Dr. Priyanjali. Uh, we were talking about you know legal reforms. Bhavani mentioned you know not just the PTA but also the ICCPR Act, and when you just mentioned you know about women standing up for women as well, uh, what sort of came to my mind is the Muslim Marriages and Divorces Act and uh, the pushback that we're seeing now against reforming it mm. and the number of women that are part of that pushback yes do you find this why 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 do you think do you think this is simply a, a result of like indoctrination or uh, unawareness or ignorance what is it whatever it is is a huge area of concern whatever it is and uh, well i mean we actually did a study to find out what it is a very small very superficial kind of a thing because what now what we think what we're looking at really is is why is it that women aren't so as supportive towards women you know that's like offshoot of a problem that you asked mm. and what certain research has shown internationally is that women can be more envious of women that's statistics internationally so we want to see in Sri Lanka in a very small community a very small number of participants whether this is actually so and whether it is based on envy that has led to this result our results didn't show that it didn't it didn't so of course it is what the did the results show 
men are also envious. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly more. <laughs> no, no, because statistical significance. So, yeah, <laughs> so we can't say quick. that. So that's very quickly. Yes. Professor, my final question to you, because I found this very amusing when I came across this stat. Um, you know how even during COVID-19, the uh, number of domestic issues were rising and with the current economic situation, there's a high chance that a man and a woman can fight because of the financial difficulties that they have. So when things get out of control and the woman wants to leave, uh, one, I mean, worst case scenario, one uh, option is to uh, seek assistance from the government or the authorities if they're not financially stable with the child or not, if they can't um, financially assist themselves. So uh, one option is the uh, shelter home that is established by the government. But we only have seven mm. shelter homes in the country. And uh, we, we actually went to a couple of places. And we weren't very happy about the uh, nothing to do with the shelter home. It's just that they don't get enough funding to um, you know, maintain uh, themselves. So what kind of pressure can that put? And why? What can you tell the government uh, about that unnecessary pressure and the, you know, the feeling of uh, helplessness? There, uh, wh wh how how do you look at that? I think that comes to what he asked about if the main person looking into the needs of women and ma women and children were a female, they would be more sensitive because they would actually feel it. You see, so the issue with the number of shelters being less and the facilities and the resources of these shelters being very poor and social services being at a very mediocre level certainly is an issue. But it is it actually somebody who is very <coughs> sensitive to these things who mm. would actually do more for the upliftment of women, which we don't see. Right. They're just so not sensitive enough. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. So we need to go uh, for a short commercial break. When we come back, it's uh, the final round. Uh, we were in conversation with uh, Dr. Harini, uh, Professor Priyanjali, Dr. Roshan, as well as Attorney at Law Bhavani Fonseca on matters concerning you, politics, women's issues, economy, as well as human rights. We now take a quick commercial break. And on the other side, it's the final round. This is Face the Nation. Stay connected. Stay with us. We will be right back. Supporting rural education means building a nation's future and together with the people of Sri Lanka, Gamada is leading from the front. Development of preschools in Rambaeva and Isin Basagama, both in rural Anuradhapura. A preschool developed in Atten Kadavala in the north central province. Clean drinking water for the children of the Maligatin school in Valimada, Bandarvela. A library for the youngsters at the Kumbuk Oya Rural School between rural Polonnaruwa and Matale. Clean water for school children in Hambe Gamua, Munragala. Classrooms for students at the primary school in Ralapanava, Anuradhapura. The complete development of the Sindhati Mata School in Kalpitiya, Puttalam. These are a few examples of Gamadha's action and impact. Thanks to you, the people. Gamadha. By the people, for the people. The hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Don't be daunted by it, as daunting as it seems that, you know, there are barriers. As we all do our part to break the bias in celebration of the International Women's Day. If we respect, I think we will get respect back. Their thinking is revolutionary. But is your bias blocking you from listening to them? Public relations is a huge market in India. Uh, it's a huge market in Singapore. Women form over 50% of the Sri Lankan population and over 60% of our total graduates. Whatever is given to you, learn everything, get your education and um, thrive. Join me in Biznomics as we bring to you eight episodes featuring trailblazing women in their chosen industries. Peace
every Saturday and Sunday at 5 p.m. Welcome back. This is uh, Face the Nation. Let's start off the final round with the Professor Priyanja de Zoiza, Professor in Clinical Psychology, Department of Psychological Medicine. What is the way forward in terms of women's rights and how can we um, champion this cause in the future? There are many things, Shamin, and I don't think we have time to talk about all of them. But one thing, if I could say, the take-home message is that if there's one amongst all these factors I'd like to mention, is about women being there for women, women being supportive of other women. And that is one major factor for the betterment of women in this country, amongst all the other factors, which we don't have time to speak about now. Uh, in, 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 in your opinion, um, uh, Professor Priyanjali, there are many individuals who want to champion the cause of women. I know a lot of women today have come to the limelight. They want to protect the rights of women. They want to speak about the rights of women. And I know a lot of men uh, who are also talking about such issues. A lot of organizations, civil rights organizations are championing this cause. What is the message you have for them? Yeah, they're doing a great job, but they need to do more. But also to still congratulate themselves for doing that because me being in the grassroots level and seeing is that sometimes when people work on women's issues it's not taken too seriously and the people who work on that issues are also not taken serious and that could be a deterrent for those people but therefore if that's you to congratulate yourself that you're doing this work despite it being a difficult task um, one final question to you uh, Professor Priyanjali uh, given sh the context today, where we see a lot of uh, problems uh, plaguing women, we saw during COVID-19, as uh, Dr. Harini mentioned before, there were a lot of domestic violence, there was a lot of child abuse cases, these were on the rise. In a situation like that, what is the psychological advice you can give for a woman? What must he, uh, what must she do? In a situation like that if there is domestic violence which is called the shadow pandemic of the COVID-19 that she doesn't have to tolerate it many women tolerate it they think they have to they have to protect the family's rights and the reputation so they stay on suffering in those kinds of marriages so what I want to tell you is you don't have to reach out for help and that you can leave if you have the proper supporting mechanisms and the will to do that Thank you very much, uh, Professor Priyanjali De Zoysa, uh, Professor in Cl Clinical Psychology, Department of Psychological Medicine. I now my move my attention to Dr. Roshan Pereira, Economist, former Director, Risk uh, Management Department, mm. Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Where, where do you see Sri Lanka in the next few months, uh, Dr. Roshan? Critical times needs very stringent and strict measures that need to be taken. If that case be the order of the day, what message do you have for the government? So I think we need to um, keep working on some of these areas that have already been discussed. I think the central bank's monetary policy statement has identified, as you rightly said, several areas that, that need to be, uh, several policies that need to be put in place. As, as you rightly also mentioned, some of it is within the purview of the central bank, some within the Ministry of Finance, some within other ministries as well. So those things need to come together, but those are all short term, right? We did. But I just want to go a bit beyond that and look, look a little beyond that. Uh, because once we get all this in place, uh, we, say we bring in, you know, have a debt restructuring program, uh, say we are going to, you know, uh, restructure for, you know, have a debt moratorium or uh, for three or five years or whatever it is. Uh, and and we're, you know, within that time, we're going to put our house in order. I think we need to be very clear that we need to have some proper checks and balances to ensure that we don't go back into this system because 
uh, I think we are all familiar with the fact that we have gone into 16 IMF programs. So this could be the 17th and then of course we can keep going on. So I think we, at this point we need to say no, we, this is going to be the last program hopefully. Uh, unless we have some, you know, some external shock that we, we have no control over. Uh, and to do that we really need to have these checks and balances. We, we know that uh, the, the, the parliament is, has overall responsibility over public finances. There is a financial responsibility management, uh, financial responsibility management act, under which there are very strict controls over public finances, on the fiscal deficits, on government deficits, on, on government debt. Uh, those need to be strictly applied. At the moment, we just they are moving targets. Every time we come close to the uh, target, we 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 uh, revise the target. And in fact, some some uh, the fiscal deficit we have never met. And there's no consequences for not be meeting those targets. In the same way, the Monetary Law Act is very strict about what actions need to be taken. And also there was a, a central bank law that was drafted or a bill that was drafted, which was never uh, implemented, basically ensuring or ha having very strict discipline over the, of, over the central bank's financing of the deficit. Because we don't want uh, a central bank to be um, able to just finance a deficit and then basically override the powers of parliament, right? Because then, then you're, 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 you're able to um, finance right. a deficit without getting parliamentary approval. So I think those things need to be put in place in addition to all these short-term measures that, that we, are, we, we right. need to take <clears throat> in order to get out of this current mess. But I think we need to put those in place so that we don't go continue go into this mess again in six months down the road or maybe one year down the road. Uh, so that's the message that I would like to right, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rosen Pereira. I now move my attention to Attorney at Law, Bhavani Fonseca. Uh, Bhavani, human rights. Right now, plaguing Sri Lanka, a wound that is still festering since the end of the conflict or even before that. What is the message you have for the government? For the government? Let's start with the president taking responsibility. That, let's start with that, because we have a president who keeps saying it's not his fault, he didn't know. So step up, take responsibility, have a cabinet that actually does its duty, have a par work with the parliament, because at the moment we see a parliament that's kept out of the loop um, a lot of the time. So. We need political leadership, we need a plan, we need short-term but long-term plans. So, I mean, the economic crisis requires a lot of attention, but there are so many. I mean, we today discuss a whole plethora of issues. I think we can talk a lot more if we have time. But unfortunately, we also just have moments like when the Human Rights Council session starts, there is a sudden interest to address it. So we need genuine political will from the political leaders to address these problems. But a very fundamental point of treating all citizens equally. Unfortunately, we have racist policies, ad hoc policies, things such as the PTA being brought to appease certain people or certain sectors. So let's start with the very basics, a president who takes responsibility, a government that has a plan, but also a government that treats its citizens with dignity, equality and respect. Let's start with that. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Attorney Adlabawani Fonseca. Dr. Harini Amrasuria, a member of parliament, National People's Power. I'm not going to ask you whether you have a message to the government. <laughs> Harini, you probably will have a lot to say. But what, what, what is it that you can tell the people? Uh, it, it's, it's tough times. Uh, it's not easy. They're looking for alternatives. They're looking for reform. In a situation like that, what is the message you have for the people? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for putting a really lovely panel together. I mean, you know, I've sat on many of these and this was one of the nicest panels to sit on. It was very <laughs> relaxed and very friendly. All, all faith goes to Shahan for putting up a good show. So, yes. thank you for that. Uh, but I just want to say, I think a lot of us talked here about coming together and I think that's important. But what's even perhaps more important is what do we come together for? So what, what is the plan? What, is, what, are we, what are the lessons we are learning from the crisis that we are in and what consensus that we can be built on what we need to do going forward? 
I think a discussion about that is really, really important right now because a lot of people are feeling very frustrated and angry and want quick solutions. I mean, we are under a lot of pressure right now to say do something, do something fast, right? But doing something fast may not fix the problem. Just as if we, if we sort of go back to kind of this uh, changing, you know, a quick change of government just to give ourselves uh, some sense of relief, that in and of itself may not fix the problem that we are facing or help us to come out of this crisis that we are undertaking unless there's consensus about what we are going to do. So I think that conversation is really, really essential and important. And I, and I think Roshan was also talking about the fact that even if you're taking the economy, you can't sort of take it, uh, you know, piecemeal. There has to be a sort of a holistic plan. And that holistic economic plan has to embody a kind of a political vision for the country. And I think we really, as a society, we really need, to, as a country, we really need to discuss and build consensus around that. So things like checks and balances, institution building, independence of institutions, accountability, transparency, having systems in place, how we, what we need to do to do all of that, I think that's a conversation we need to have. It's also a conversation we have to have as citizens and, and see this as much as our responsibility as, uh, as much as the politicians or political parties. I think that that is what really needs to happen right now and that's the conversation we need to have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harini Amrasuri. Thank you very much, Dr. Roshan Pereira, Economist, former Director, Risk Management Department of Central Bank of Sri Lanka, uh, Attorney at Law, Bhavani Fonseca, Human Rights Advocate, Professor Priyanjali Dizoiza, Professor in Clinical Psychology, Department of Psychological Medicine, Dr. Harini Amrasuri, Member of Parliament of the National People's Power for joining us this evening on Face the Nation. Thank you very much, Nadim. Thank you very much, Azra, for joining us this evening on the show. I have to echo the same sentiment that you echoed, uh, Harini. It was one of the best panels that I have had the privilege to moderate on Face the Nation tonight. So uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening on Face the Nation. Uh, I leave you tonight with a quote, as I always do. Whatever title or office we may be privileged to hold, it is what we do that defines who we are. Each of us must decide what kind of person we want to be, what kind of legacy that we want to pass on. Take care and good night.